Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Um, so um, I will make a small um, uh, review of what we have seen uh, last time. So let me just. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So, um, okay. so that's what I wanted to show. Sorry, I have to come back a little bit. Yeah. So um, last time I, I we talked a little bit about this um, problem of um, elimination of near potent points for uh, foliation by curves. So I recall you that um, um, you have this. Um, this triple that I called a, a singular related manifold. So a manifold equipped with a um, normal crossing divisor and a, a foliation by curves, which of course can contain singularities. So, um, uh, but with the con these two conditions, so I suppose that the foliation is everywhere tangent to this divisor. And moreover that the, the nilpotent locus of the foliation is of dimension greater or equal than, than two. So the, uh, this nilpotent locus is, uh, let's say, the bad guy. Let's say the, the the locus that we want to eliminate by by some some sort of uh, resolution of singularities by by some sequence of uh, blowing ups. Because well, let's say that uh, the points which are not nilpotent are the points where uh, you have a sort of a, um, good local decomposition of your vector field into a nilpotent and semi-simple part. And you can use uh, this uh, semi-simple part to, uh, for instance, to develop a theory of normal forms. So, okay. So the idea, generally speaking, is to um, use algebra, let's see, in the, by, mean, by which I mean that to use a resolution of singularities to um, simplify as much as possible your foliation and then apply more, let's say, more, uh, analytic tools like uh, normal form theory and uh, the study of uh, small divisor problems also. Right, so the goal is this one. And so as I recall, uh, we try to find this for each compact, for each relatively complex set, we would like to, to define this sequence of blowups such that the nipotent locus at the end is empty. And moreover, we don't we not like to modify the the, the foliation outside the nilpotent lock. So I'm I mean insisting on this point because you're going to see in a moment that it's a quite delicate point. Um, okay, so um, so one of the goals of this course is also to 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 teach you how to make computations, right? So how do you compute explicitly the the, the resolution of single rights of um, foliation that they given by some explicit expression. So the idea is that the computations are easier to done by using the, by forcing the, 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 the expression in this lower ethical basis, where um, let's say you force the appearance of this um, um, x1 d over the x1, xn d over xn, because this is precisely the, the, the basis which transforms nicely under this power maps, like the blowing up, right? So this is another map. Well, I just recall in this. Um, so I'm just writing this blow up as, um, let's say, like, like a, substitution, a substitution map. So the variable x1 goes to x1, x2 goes to x1, x2, and so on. And then each one of these derivations is mapped to something like this. It's mapped linearly. Okay, so I'm just going to jump this because it's already done. Yeah. So one of, one of the points that I, go, I want to stress is that. You have to be careful in the choice of the, the blowing up centers because uh, it's not, let's say, um, even if you um, the, ask your, your blow up center to, to have normal cross with the divisor, you can, in some sense, um, uh, get uh, make the singularities get worse by, by if you don't choose it uh, appropriately. So for instance, here I, got, I have given, a, given a, an example where you, you choose a blow up center which has a tangency with the foliation, right? So my foliation here is given by, let's say for K equals to one, is such a set of parabolas like this. And now I choose a blow up center, which is a, let's say one of the axes. So let me show you that in the second case, so of course this, uh, this vector field has, uh, it's, it has no singularities at all. So it's an elementary one. 
But if you blow up with a, um, a center which has a tangency with a leaf like this, then you get a non-elementary singular point, right? So, well, in the logarithmic basis, so just you re rewrite this derivation forcing the appearance of this logarithmic basis. So you see that it makes it shows up this um, um, term of polar, polar order one, and then well, the center which uh, the center x equals to zero uh, has no problem; it's, it's still um, elementary. But when you blow up with the center given by the by the horizontal axis, then as you can see here, um, okay, so the, the the total transform of your vector field is simply uh, computed by let's say replacing um, x so this uh, this coefficient gets replaced by x times y x minus 1 times sorry by x minus 1 times y minus 1 and this one well transforms uh, as you expect and then you you have to multiply to get something which is not meromorphic you have to multiply by the equation of the divisor which is y and then you see the appearance of this uh, singularity here, which is, uh, it's in fact uh, near potent singularity. So it's not elementary. So you have to take care when you, you do the blow up. Uh, uh, the, the center should, should always be invariant by, the, by the, the, the derivation. Otherwise you, at some point you're going to create such kind of problem. Well, so let me start with the well-known results. So in dimension two, what I call the elimination of the important points is, is the, the so-called Bayesian or Seidenberg theorem, which shows that you always can eliminate these important locks by a finite sequence of uh, blow-ups, right? But uh, let's say contrary to the intuition, uh, this result is false if you suppose that the ambient dimension is greater or equal than three, right? So we usually are used it to say that, well, the, these statements on the resolution of singularities are are sort of tautology because, uh, well, it's just perhaps difficult to prove that it should be true all the time. But for the, the what I have just said to you, it's um, this statement is false in dimension greater equal than three, at least if you do what we usually call the, the, the blow ups, right? So this is the, an example that appears. No, I think it's not highly employed, but, but uh, it's, it's due to, to Fernando Sanz and uh, Fernando Sanchez Salas. So, um, well, it starts with, with a very, very well-known phenomenon, which is the following. You take the, the Whitney umbrella, so it has already appeared in the, in the course of uh, Andre, I think. So there's this uh, Whitney umbrella. So I'm, I'm writing this in this way. So the, the handle of the, the Whitney umbrella now is this, the vertical axis, the Z axis, right? So, well, this is um, uh, an, algebraic, uh, an algebraic set. The zero set of omega, and uh, well, this um, what there is a see in here is the is the, the the property of this um, the point at the origin. This is a so-called pinch point, and uh, in fact, there is a symmetry in the Whitney umbrella, which is the following end. If you parameterize these two, um, so you take the the slices given by z equals to constant, so you have to these two um, uh, straight lines which cross which are just written, written as y equals to square root of z times x. But there is a symmetry here, which the following one, if you make, let's say in the complex domain, you make one turn around the, the origin in the z axis, then these branches uh, get interchanged between them, just because by analytic continuation, when you make one, one turn, then the, the square roots get, the two um, determination of the square root get uh, exchanged between them. So this is one of the characteristics of this pinch point. And the fact is that even if we take the, this as analytic and a, an algebraic set, there's a theorem. It's not very hard to prove that, um, in fact, you cannot, you cannot eliminate. So this is, a, of course, this, this point on the origin is not a normal crossing point for the, it's not a normal crossing point for, the, for this um, uh, algebraic set. And in fact, the only way to, to turn this into a uh, normal crossing situation is that at some point you have to blow up the handle, right? So there is a, a very, let's say, even a more, more general uh, result which says the following. So you start with, uh, let's say, C3 with uh, 
this embedded uh, algebraic set, and you consider any birational map such that it's uh, it, it's an isomorphism uh, along the the handle. Right? So it, so it's a, a birational map which which is doesn't touch the handle. Then the, this pinch point is um, stable in the sense that you you get exactly exactly the same configuration uh, in the let's say in the the new uh, variety. Okay, so it's a quite stable situation uh, in this sense. And now here I've drawn the the, the ve a vector field which is tangent to this uh, uh, which is tangent to this Witten umbrella. So you just make the computations, and you see that when you apply delta to omega you get just a multiple of omega. I think it's uh, two times omega or something like this. So this means that um, all the, the solution curves of this uh, vector field or the leaves of uh, the foliation are um, tangent to this, um, to this with, uh, with the umbrella, right? So well, uh, and, and you, you, you can see that the, in this case, the, the handle is just, um, except for the origin, is just a, 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 a leaf of the, of the Witten umbrella. Right. So, so it's not, you know, it's not formed by similar part. But well, okay, so as I said, uh, you can perhaps take this at some point, you could um, imagine the real, a resolution of singularity which take this handle as the center of the, of the blowing up. Because, well, you can see that for in this case, the, the point, the pinch point is not an elementary point for this associated vector. But now the, the example of Sanchez uh, Salas and uh, Fernando Sanz, it modifies a little bit this example by adding this new red term here, right? So what happens is that when you uh, uh, add this red term, uh, this uh, Whitney umbrella, in fact, becomes a formal and non-convergent Whitney umbrella. So uh, by adding this lambda here, when you, you try to, to write the, the equation for the, the handle, so let's say you just make some formal expansion like this, and then you replace on the differential uh, equation associated to delta, and you try to, to solve it. And you find that the, the only possible equation is, uh, so it's a, you, you determine this, this coefficient by, by, by recurrence, and you get some kind of a jeffrey type uh, growth of these uh, terms, which shows that this axis, this handle cannot be convergent, right? So it means that you don't have the right to take this handle as a, a center for your blowing up pr uh, procedure, because at least if you want to stay in the, the category of uh, analytic manifolds, you, you're stuck here. So this is the counterexample to the, the statement in dimension greater equal than three. So how to solve this, right? So, so I said that the handle is, is non-analytic, so you cannot take it as a center. So, in this case, you are stuck. So the solution is to, let's say, to enlarge the, the set of allowed um, maps by considering what we call the weighted blowups, right? So what's, the, what's a weighted blowup? I'm going to spend some moments on explaining this because it's central to what comes next. So um, the usual blowups can be seen as, um, let's say, a way to separate the, the orbits of the action of a torus on C n minus zero, which given which is just given by, by taking all the lines. To, so the orbits of this torus action are just the, the lines through the origin, complex lines. And then the blow up just separate these lines uh, uh, in uh, one, uh, let's say in one map. And now the idea is that instead of taking the, the usual torus action by taking the, the weights, uh, one, 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 you take a more general situation where you allow some um, vector of a positive integer, a non-zero vector positive integers, uh, omega one, omega n, and you just take this map here, right? So in this case, imagine that um, the, the orbits of the story vector are just, are just this uh, monomial curves through the origin. And uh, well, you can, uh, you can, try to, to understand what's the quotient of Cn minus the origin by the action of this uh, torus. And this is a well-known object, which is so called the, the weighted projective space, right? So if you take the usual case where omega equals to one, 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 and so on, you get the usual blow-up space, 
uh, usual projective safe, sorry. And uh, this uh, sort of generalization, we're going to, to, to show to you some picture. So now how to define the weighted blow up associated to this um, torus section, right? So, um, the, so the, the, this pi here is just the, 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 co the let's say the, the quotient map, which associates to each orbit, the associated point on the, the quotient space. Right, so, the, so the, the quotient map, and now what I'm going to do is that I can consider the graph of this quotient map. So it's a subset of, um, as a subset of CN, uh, well, times uh, the projective space, the weighted projective space, right? So, yeah, so, so in principle, the graph is just, just uh, lives in the, the, the product of Cn minus zero uh, times uh, the, the weighted projective space. But I want to consider this map on the, the closure, by which I mean Cn times P minus one, and then I take the M tilde as being the Zariski closure of this graph uh, on this product here, right? So this M tilde is what I'm going to call the blow up, the blow up space. And the, the, the corresponding birational map, which I'm going to obtain just by extending this, uh, this, uh, let, uh, so, sorry, it's not very good notation, but the, the projection map, which is just the projection of this um, manifold on the first, Coordinate, it's what I'm going to call the blow up, the blow up, weighted blow up of the origin in CN. So, so just I have just made a drawing here in the usual case where we have blow uh, the, the all the weights equals to one. So, in this case, uh, let's say uh, the, the basis here is uh, of dimension, I say, I just made a picture in the case where I have R2. And then you can imagine that in this case, the blow up space is a sort of um, Moebius band which uh, develops uh, above. So the, in the vertical direction, we have just uh, the, the one dimension projective space. And then this projection here is precisely the, the, the blowing up map, right? So uh, let's write some equations for this blow up, for this weighted blow up. So as I mentioned to you, the, the there is this weighted projective space, which has in fact some um, additional uh, structure with respect to the usual projective space, because how do you cover the, the usual projective space with, uh, with uh, coordinates? You just take this, um, some slice for the action like this, right? And then uh, you just identify each point of the, the slice with an orbit of your reaction. But here, uh, as I, I've drawn this picture, you can see that if I, I fix a slice, let's say, for instance, in this case, I fixed the slice given by x1 equals to one, the orbits can cut this slice in two different points. So here, for instance, I, I, have, I have taken the weights um, one, two, and one, right? So in this slice, uh, uh, you cannot separate these two points. If you're going to, to define the, let's say, the, the, the orbit space. And this leads you to um, a sort of a new structure, which is called a, a, a normal fold structure, right? So, so how do you define the, the charge of a blowing up, uh, weighted blow ups? So, the x direction of shards, so for instance, this one that I, I've written, I've drawn here, right? So, it parameterizes the, the orbits. Uh, cut in this slice, and in this case, you can write this as a, uh, as a substitution map of this form, right? So x1 goes to y1 to the, to the power of omega 1, x, x2 goes to y2 to the power of omega 2, so on. So in this case, you can see y2 up to yn as the coordinates on the slice, and these are the parameters given by, by the the, the torus, right? So the why the why uh, one here is, is just a t in my previous notation. Okay. So now the new thing is that uh, this y one i n can has to be interpreted as an orbifold chart in the blow up blow up space, 
by which I mean that um, they live in, the, let's say, in the affine space CN, but now which should be equipped with um, a group action, which takes into account the symmetry that I've just drawn to you in the previous slide. So here, for instance, in the case uh, of these parabolas, there is a, a, a symmetry given by the action of, a, of a Z2, right? So the, the re reflection with respect to the, to, the ver uh, to the horizontal action. So um, in general, if you have these weights, uh, omega one and omega two up to again, there is a small, there is a small misprint here, the, the, the group which are going to act in this um, CN to give you the, let's say the, the, the symmetry on the slice is the cyclic group Z quotiented by omega one times Z. And the, this action is defined as follows. So omega y1 goes to psi y1 and uh, yk go to, goes to psi to the minus omega k yk, where, where uh, psi is just a, a primitive root of, root of infinity, right? So this takes into account the symmetry that I've just explained to you. Okay, so the other charts are defined analogously. So the new, the, 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 the new um, information here is that uh, this new manifold, the, the manifold that I, I obtained by this weighted blow ups is not a manifold, should not be, be considered manifold in the usual um, sense, but now with uh, uh, as a, an, an object which is called a Norbifold, right? So I'm going to give a very small uh, um, uh, review of uh, this, uh, of what is a man, uh, an Norbifold. So I, I, I recommend this, this, um, this book where this, there are very detailed uh, proofs and uh, definitions and so on. So what's a Norbifold? So roughly speaking, a Norbifold is um, an, um, let's say a topological space where you have a, a group of local symmetries acting uh, on each uh, neighborhood, right? So you have some underlying topological space M, which is hard of space. So sorry, it's X, I could correct this. this is, it should be um, M here. So a Norbifold chart on this uh, manifold is, is given by a triple. So given by an open set of C N or R N and a group, a finite subgroup of the group of automorphisms, of diffeomorphisms of uh, this open set. And then a map uh, phi, which goes from U to M, and which is moreover um, invariant by the, so this map should be invariant by the action of, um, of, uh, of the group G, in the sense that should map all points on the same orbit into the same point on G. So of course they uh, in this in, in such a way that it defines an homeomorphism between the, the quotient of U by G and the, the image uh, open set phi of U, right? So the idea is that uh, locally this orbifold should be should be uh, look at that as uh, the quotient of uh, U by this group action G, right? So now there is some. Um, a, a way to define a, a compatible charts. So I'm, I'm not going to enter too much in the detail here, but uh, you can define compatible charts by by recurring that uh, by firstly define what is an, an embedding of a Norbifold chart into another one. And uh, well, I'm, I think I'm going to 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 go a little bit quick in this because just I just copied the, the definition which appeared in, in this book. So for a Norbifold chart is, uh, sorry, a Norbifold atlas on, a, on the manifold L is just given by a collection of these uh, triples. So open sets, finite group and embeddings such that they are uh, compatible in the sense that they tailor here and such that phi of you, uh, they are maximal this and they, they form um, an open cover of M. <laughs> so when you have a Norbifold, you, you can uh, define a sub orbifold as given by some subset Y of M, such that on, on each local chart, U, J, H, the, let's say the counter image of uh, this uh, subset uh, Y is a G invariant submanifold of, uh, of U. 
right? So it should be invariant by, so should, in fact, it should be invariant by the, the action of the group G as a, as a subset of, uh, of U. Okay. So one of the important things that, um, let's say in the, in the, when this object has been uh, introduced, uh, let's say for the first time, people had the tendency to concentrate just on the structure of the, the manifold M. So it's a, let's say a manifold with um, quotient singularities. But now uh, it's important also to, to, to keep the information about the, the groups, right? So the, the local group action are part of the structure. So it should, should be taken into account, uh, not only the, the manifold itself. Sorry, sorry, Daniel. Uh, yes. Here, so the action of the group. So you, you, so you, you describe it chart by chart, somehow, yes. right? So do you mean that there is one group acting on the on the on the manifold, or is it a local action by possibly different groups? Yes, it's a local action. So um, let me just go back here. So the, the pro, for all the prototypical example is the, the the example of this um, the yeah. orbit chart on the on this. Uh, Flow of the manifold. So you see that according to the chart that you choose, you have a different group which acts. So if you take this, this is the group, the secret group with which acts in the first chart. Ah, yeah, okay. But in so the second, in, in another chart, it would be another group. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to make an explicit example in a moment. So just a simple example to show that now the underlying topological space can be singular. So, for instance, if you take um, x to be C2 uh, quotiented by, by the group by z, uh, z over 2z, let's say just by symmetry with respect to the origin, then this is just given by the, the spectrum, the spectrum of uh, the group of, of the, sorry, the ring of invariance. So the ring of invariance of um, polynomials in two variables with respect to this um, action is just generated by x square, xy and y square. And of course, there is a relation which says that if the second one to the square is equals to the first times the, the, the second. So it's just given by, let's say, the spectrum of the, this ring here. And so x is a quadratic cone, right? So it's the, it's the ideal, uh, the zero set of this uh, thing here. So. So what's the idea here is that um, you, you, when you give it this uh, extra freedom of choosing this uh, weighted blow ups, you are going to, to, to adapt this weight in order to take into account some natural quasi homogeneous filtration of your object, right? So this extra freedom, in fact, we're going, we are going to allow us to, to, to uh, for instance, to solve the problem that is posed by the, 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 the example of uh, Sanz and, uh, and Sanchez Salas. So let's see the example of the Whitney umbrella, right? So without vector fields here, but even in the case of, um, of uh, algebraic sets, uh, let's see what happens. So you take this uh, algebraic set here, and I, I'm going to blow up the origin with weight one, two, and two, right? So in the Z, so in the Z directional chart, this corresponds to this uh, automorphism field here, uh, sorry, sorry, for the substitution. Uh, polynomial substitution. And you see that uh, when you write the Whitney umbrella in these new coordinates, you get something like z to the power of four, which you factorize, factors out, and then y square minus uh, y, x square. And you see that here is a, you have just a normal crossing divisor. So, okay. so I, I'm just make a drawing here. So what happens in the z, let's say in the z directional chart, you just have a, an orbital chart, which is C3 with a group Z over 2Z and um, an embedding phi, okay? And the action of Z over 2Z is just, just the symmetry here. So X goes to minus X, Y goes to Y, and Z goes to minus Z. So of course, this is just the symmetry which uh, when you apply this change here to the right-hand side of these equations, you just just get get the same variables on the uh, on the left hand side, right? So just it means that two point two points which are on the same orbit are mapped downstairs to the same point by the blow by the blow down map. So you see here that this uh, 
let's say the, the Whitney umbrella is covered, each one of these parts of the Whitney umbrella is covered two times by the, so in the, in the right hand side, I've, I've drawn the, I've drawn the, 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 the equation of this, uh, the, the transform of the Whitney umbrella. So we have this, uh, the, this X and Y, and you see that this, uh, two hyperplanes here are mapped. So the symmetry is, the, is just given by exchanging these uh, two parts. And in fact, you cover two times the, the, the red part and you cover two times the blue part here, right? So, but I mean, in this blow it up, in this uh, orbifold chart, you get a normal crossing situation without blowing up in some sense, the, the handle that, that was the problem in, uh, in, our, uh, in the example of, uh, of the Fernandes. Right, so, so if you don't like too much to work with the manifold with singularities, there is a, another way to think of these things by uh, over, at least if you work over R, is to work in the category for manifolds with corners. Right? So manifolds with corners are just manifolds, which are locally modeled by, um, by open sets of, um, by, uh, by quadrants of Rn, right? So in this case, you can replace your weighted blow up by a, what you call a, a weighted spherical blow up, which is just given by a map. So now we have this sphere here. So we just given this map, a proper uh, analytic, uh, more analytic map from R positive times S minus N to Rn, which is, uh, well, it's just given by this, right? And uh, in this case, you have to enter the, the exceptional divisor. So this is um, the thing that just collapses to the, the origin by the blow up map. It's just a frontier, a boundary of your manifold, which is just a, a copy of, uh, of this here. Right. So just make a drawing here. So you see that here, um, the, the, in fact, instead of uh, um, dealing with this um, um, orbifold charts, you see that in fact, you can separate the positive and negative part of the orbits by just adding the, this sphere and saying that uh, you just take the, the, the positive parts. This is an alternative way to say things. So one of the advantages of this, um, let's say of, of work in this setting that you, you stay in some sense in the category of, of manifolds, but there's a drawback, which is the fact that you forget the group in some sense. And uh, it means that there is, a, when you make this blob, there's, a, there's an intrinsic symmetry here that in some sense you lose when you don't look at the group of symmetries, uh, which is given by the, the, the by, which is given by the, the orbifold charts. Okay. So for, let's say for this point of view, I recommend to you this uh, very nice book of uh, Melrose, where he makes uh, many, many, uh, he has a, a very long discussion about the analysis on manifold with corners. So his idea is to solve the uh, partial differential equations in this kind of, uh, of objects. Uh, I'm going to see later on that there is some relation with uh, what I'm going to, to speak about. Okay, so just a small example. So if you take the Whitney umbrella, and now I'm going to make um, a blow up, a real blow up of the, of the Whitney umbrella. Well, and uh, now there are two shards because even if, if you take the z direction of shark, there, there, is, there is a, so there are two different slices here, z positive and z negative. And this gives you two different uh, shards here. So this is the first one. And this is the second one with minus z square here. So you see that in the first chart, you get um, these two lines which are crossing, which the, let's say this, these two planes, even by y equals to minus plus or minus x, but in the second chart, you just have this equation here. And of course, this is the, just the fact that, um, let's say, I mean, I've just make a, a real drawing of the Whitney umbrella, just the fact that for z negative, the zero set uh, in R3 is just uh, this, uh, this line, right? Okay, but anyway, uh, let's see, you see that everything here is, is normal crossings. Uh, so in some sense, you have won the game by this uh, blowing up without touching the, ha the handle. Okay, so 
uh, what I explained to you is the case where you blow up um, a point in, uh, in CN or RN. So uh, when you try to, to generalize this to, to blowing up a center, which are no local, say to, to, to center a submanifold on a, on a manifold, you have to take some extra care here. Why? Because uh, let's say in order to blow up the, 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 the manifold C given by x1 equals to etc equals to xk equals to zero. In fact, you have to, to make, to repeat the construction that I've made a moment ago, but now taking this torus action, which only acts on the first k variables, right? So it does, doesn't, does, does not touch the, the, the remaining variables. And the problem is that in this case, uh, this action is defined on a neighborhood of each point of your, let's say a global manifold C, and it defines a, a filtration in the local ring, which is so-called a quasi-homogeneous quasi filtration, right? So it gives, says, says to you that you have to give weight omega one to xn, et cetera, weight omega k, uh, omega k to xk. But when you change from one, let's say from one chart to the other chart, which covers our manifold, you have to, to be careful to, to guarantee that this um, weighted filtration is compatible, right? So I draw this here. Uh, yeah. So they, they, they did, they did that, uh, in fact, a weighted blow up is not defined exactly by the, this torus action, but more precisely by the quasi homogeneous filtration of the local ring associated to this, right? So you have the, let's say, the local ring at the point P, and then uh, let's say let's call this O0, and then there is a, a, a nested sequence of uh, sub rings here where um, the, yes, so where uh, X1 is, is, is lies on the O omega one and so on, and Xn lies on O omega n, right? And so uh, an alternative you say, uh, way of saying this is that uh, each, uh, each OK is the subring of functions of quasi-homogeneous degree of quasi-homogeneous weight uh, greater or equal than K. Right. So if you want to define now a quasi-homogeneous blow up along a sub-manifold or a sub fold, more general sub fold of uh, Emma, we have to, 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 to have a, a global trivialization such that the transition maps between the two different charts should respect this uh, filtration here, right? Okay, so the, let's say a more fancy way to see to, to say this is the following one. Uh, you have to have, a, 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 let's say, a, a, a sequence of nested um, ideal shifts of your, of your structure, structure shift, F0, F1, Fn, and so on. So this is a global um, uh, nested sequence of ideal shifts in such a way that uh, you have this, um, let's say filtration-like property. And at each point P on the support of this, um, this ideal shifts, um, this talk of this filtration coincides with the cosmic fil uh, filtration defined above. So I, I'm asking this just to, to have this um, a sort of filtration by ideal shifts in such a way that locally it corresponds to a cosmosine filtration. Okay, so, well, this is a, a let's see, a more fancy way to see this, but um, in more uh, concrete terms, what I mean, the following thing. So suppose that you, you, you want to blow up the, the y-axis on, on C3, right? So with weights one beta. So in this case, Assume that you have some uh, local trivialization given by, by, the, by the variables, let's say x and y. And now you are going to look at all possible uh, automorphisms on the variables x and y, which preserve the quasi homogeneous filtration associated to one beta. Right? So, roughly speaking, it's just given by, uh, let's say, maps of this form, where, uh, in fact, um, since um, y has a weight beta, 
when you make, um, let's say, a, a translation like a y goes to y plus psi times x to the power l, the, the, the exponent which appears on l here should be greater or equal than beta. Okay. So this is, a, let's say, in general, each kind of this uh, automorphisms here preserve the one beta zero quasi homogeneous filtration of uh, C x uh, z, right? So, okay, so now I, I just made a, a general statement about uh, which kind of automorphisms preserve this filtration. Uh, sorry, just go, go back. So um, in fact, given a, a manifold, um, an arbitrary manifold, submanifold C on a manifold M, the, the existence of such a kind of, uh, of um, so, and given some, some weight uh, omega to say, the existence of a trivialization such that the transition maps preserve the filtration is a topological, a non trivial topological restriction, right? So, it's not true that you can always achieve this condition on any manifold and uh, for any sub manifold. So, this is one of the things that has to, to be taken care of when you try to, to apply this kind of uh, generalized blow ups. Okay, so mm. so let's just just me give some uh, expressions on how to compute the the weighted blow up for for a vector field. So it's very similar to the case where we have the usual blow ups. So assume that you you want to make a blow up in the x one direction with weights omega one omega k. And again, it's very easy to see how the logarithmic basis uh, transforms. So the x1 d over the x1 goes now to, to some linear combination of, uh, of this type. So you see here that uh, omega 1 appears, um, all the weights appear uh, like this. And the other, the other elements of the logarithmic basis are preserved. So for instance, um, if you take this uh, vector field here, which is called um, the N node. So recall, if you, I, I recall to you that the, this is the case where the, the orbits are just the, the curves given by Y, uh, sorry, yeah, yes. Y equals, uh, y equals to X, equals to some constant times x to the power n, right? So in fact, if you take the blow up with weight one n, you're going to separate the orbits of this, um, of this um, node here. And this is precise because the, the solution curves are the orbits of the torus action uh, given by this. So in fact, the, this, this blow up is, is chosen in such a way that you separate all the orbits of this, uh, this action. Okay, so uh, if I, I don't know if you recall, but we, we have drawn the, I, I've explained to you, let me just go back, no, yeah. The, the case of um, the cuspidal singularity, sorry, I just, uh, yeah, it's a long time ago. So the cuspidal singularity was an example of a non-elementary singularity where uh, you could apply some sort of, um, of resolutions to, to achieve a situation where the, the transverse behavior were, was well explained by, um, let's say, by some um, transition maps locally defined near the, the tree saddles, which appear here. So for the usual blow ups, you have to take three, uh, three different steps in order to achieve the, the elementary singularity, the elementary situation. But now let's see that in the using the weighted blow ups, in fact, you, you take into account the, the natural quasi homogeneous structure of this cuspidal singularities, and uh, a single blow up will suffice. Okay. But it's not, let's say, the, there is also perhaps I'm going to finish with this example. So you take this uh, cuspidal singularity, right? So um, you recall to you that this, uh, there is the, this, the cusp, which is almost a first integral because it's. Um, Let's say it's a first integral for the initial part. And then there is a small perturbation delta here, which accounts for the non-integrability of your foliation. But we'll, we'll suppose that this part here is of, 
is of weight greater than the initial part. By this, I mean the, the weight with respect to the filtration given by two and three. So now to, to blow up this example, uh, I'm going to, first of all, to write it in the, in the logarith logarithmic basis. So enforcing the appearance of x d over dx here. So here you get, get x minus one times y, and here three x squared y minus one, right? And now the natural choice is, is to use the weights two and three. Right, because why? Because this is the quasi the, the, the quasi homogeneous weights which come from the the natural quasi homogeneity uh, structure of the of the first integral, the almost first integral. So, as I said to you, the the first term, the, the first parenthesis gets mapped to this. The second one it's, it's uh, preserved, right? So, and then when you regroup the terms, you get x y x. So this expression. And the, the the perturbation terms gets multiplied by the powers the power x two of the where x is is the equation of the, the exceptional divisor. So now um, recall that I, I I want to keep this this um, condition that the, the exceptional divisor should not be should should be invariant right, but not formed by nilpotent points. Right, so if you want to eliminate the nilpotent points which appear on the exceptional divisor, by which I mean the, the line x equals to zero, you have to divide out this uh, the equation of uh, x uh, of delta by x, and you, uh, what you, you get just by factoring out um, x is is the second expression here. I don't know if you can see it. Yes. Okay, so now in the y chart. Uh, well, I'm going to be a little bit quick here because we don't have too much time. You get this expression. But, well, uh, yeah, so the, you get this, this second expression. Perhaps I'll, I'll leave it to an exercise to, to, to show it. But the, 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 the result is that, in fact, if you look at the, the, the singularities which appear on both charts, you see that, uh, in fact, they, they get their elementary charts, their elementary singularities. So you get these two saddles, which appear, let's just go back here. So in this, um, in this first chart, you see that uh, the, the singularities appear by, by, the, the, by y equals to minus one or equal or, or, or plus one. And then on each one of them, you, you get a, a set of singularities. So um, in some sense, you, 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 in this case, you, you succeed by a single quasi-homogeneous blow up, right? Okay, so in this case, just, uh, just, let's just study the, the, the symmetries of the orbifold chart that you, you, you obtain. So there are two charts which cover uh, sorry. So now you have this. Your um, weighted projective space is this um, blue line here, right? So you have two charts which cover it. So one chart is C two mod the action of um, the of the, the two symmetry group of the two cyclic group, and the other chart is C two modulo the action of um, of this three symmetry group, right? So in fact, um, in my drawing. In one chart, you see these two singularities, right? So, but in fact, in the quotient, they are identified with, with a, single, a single singularity. And in the other chart, you see these three singularities here, which again are identified with this single singularity in the, in the let's say, in the quotient uh, ambient space. Okay. Well, uh, and now, uh, if you look at them, the, you, you recover the, the this um, allonomy groups that I've, I've discussed with you uh, by this uh, name. <clears throat> well, perhaps I'm going to finish with this. Uh, in fact, when you look at the expression of the, let's say this expression of the vector field in the first chart, which is given by, by this, right? So of course the, the group of symmetries, it acts on, the, on, on delta one, and delta one is, is, is symmetric in some sense with respect to the action of z over two z. I'm just going to 
<clears throat> compute this action to show to you. So you see here, um, you, you, you have this uh, vector field on, on the first chart, and then there is Z over two Z, which acts on this. It acts because uh, of course you, you, you obtain this vector field by, by uh, the weighted blow up, which, which has the symmetry, right? So how is the symmetry uh, goes? When you make them, the group acts on X goes from to minus X and the group on Y goes to minus Y. And then by a simple, by a simple computation, you see that the, 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 when you make this group acts on the, this expression, it gets multiplied by minus one, right? So here I've just made a, a drawing of the, the vector field in the first chart. You see, you see that, that there is a symmetry here, which is intrinsic to the, the, the transformation that is made. And on the, the other chart, you have this uh, symmetry given by the action of uh, Z over 3Z, which is uh, again, this one. So let me just finish. I have tried to make some small uh, drawing. So in this case, uh, recall this, um, this set, which I, I, I've drawn here, is the blow adapt space. And here you have, as I said, the defoliation, which leaves on the, on the, on the, let's say on the surface, on the, on the horizontal surface here, which is lifted to this um, singular set. And then you get, um, you, you get this, uh, this non-singular, uh, let's say this elementary foliation by lifting. Okay, so I, I think I just, that's all for today. So uh, thank you for your attention, but I, I, I'm going to put these notes on the, on the web page so you can, you can consult it if you want more details. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniel.